probiotic is a live organism, whether it's a bacterium, a yeast, or a fungus. And then the prebiotic is a fermentable substrate. the host of the Dairy Nutrition Black Belt uh, Podcast. Uh, my guest today is Dr. Todd Calloway, an associate professor at University of Georgia, uh, and he studied uh, gut microbiology for about his entire career. Um, what we're going to talk about today is he, he's corresponding author to a, a recent review. It's not out yet. It's in, in print in Journal of Dairy Science, and it concerns uh, probiotics and some other uh, uh, modifiers. So we're going to start about that. The The review is very extensive. It covers cows and calves, but for this discussion, we're going to limit it just to cows. So w welcome, Todd. Thank you very much. I appreciate it, Bill. Um, what I'd like to start with, I read this paper and, and you have a table and you talk about probiotics, prebiotics, direct fed microbials, and then a new term for me anyway is eubiotics. Can you kind of differentiate those terms? Sure. Um, basically, we, we start, or the industry has drifted towards these terms in the past five to seven years based upon all the confusion when it was just direct fed microbials that lumped everything together in one column. So eubiotics are basically what we used to think of as DFM or in the human side, what they call probiotics. The terminology gets really weird. So a eubiotic is a feed additive that does, plays an essential role in supporting animal performance or welfare through supporting gut health, which is a pretty broad thing. But it covers basically everything that we use in the animal industry as a feed additive to try to make anything better with that animal that falls in the eubiotic category. Okay. Um, then a probiotic is a living organism which is going to be beneficial to the health of the host. So it is a fermentable substrate. So any kind of material like an oligosaccharide or inulin that the host isn't going to be able to degrade, but the microbes can't. So it's the term, and I've used this for years that someone else came up with, was colonic food. So it's food for that microbial population only. Then you have your postbiotics that are end products of fermentation. That's the what well, in the dairy industry we traditionally think of as those yeast products where things have been grown, they heat treat or lice or cook it, and then we use that cell wall material or whatever it is we're looking at. So that's a postbiotic, after it was alive, is where the terminology comes from. And then if you couple like a prebiotic and a probiotic or pre, pro, and post, that's symbiotics, and that's a term of, you know, synergy, synergistic biotics. So that way you can add a population, you can put something in to try to maintain that population that you want in the environment. So it's a powerful technique. It's not one we use a lot yet in the cattle industry, but it's one that uh, is getting a lot of play and use to try to control things like irritable bowel and Crohn's disease in mm -hmm. humans. And in, in, in livestock there, are cattle in particular, what, what are the, do we know modes of action or what are the proposed modes of action? And I know these are very broad terms, but are very yeah, there broad are, categories. Yes, there's a lot of different modes of actions. And the truth is, depending on what product you're looking at, some of them are going to use one, two or three different modes or even more than more than that of action on the microbial population and on the host. So, you know, and depending on what, where you are, what their diet is, you're going to look at the rumen or that hindgut. So we can't just say they all do this. It's almost a tailored approach, but things like changing the microbial population, uh, helping create a pH stabilization in the rumen, reducing some of that lactate accumulation. 
And you know, that's one of those neat things with some of the postbiotic products. They will contain uh, organic acids like dicarboxylic acids like malate or fumarate, stuff that I worked with on my master's degree way too long ago. And uh, that promotes the uptake of lactic acid by certain members of the microbial population. But you find a lot of this material in many, in many postbiotic products. So you also learn there's growth factors that can stimulate some of the facultatives to suck that oxygen up, change that acetate to propionate ratio to increase the energy to the animal, put more butyrate out that's going to help improve that gut integrity and gut health. So there's a lot of things it's doing in the rumen, but also in that hind gut. Again, more butyrate leads to this improved gut health and improved nutrient absorption because you help that gut integrity. But there's been a, a really cool study done back in 2017 by um, Ajay, uh, by Ajay that what they did was look at cattle and they gave them a probiotic treatment. And that was the only difference, but they looked at the genes that were being upregulated or downregulated, and they saw about eleven thousand genes that were changed in expression by the by the cow, where it was affecting pathways of inflammation, also growth hormone signaling pathways. So, adding a probiotic to the ration of these cattle were changing what genes that cow was expressing, and that has really kind of altered my thinking dramatically. And this is where Mike Steele and I were sitting at a con at anim or dairy science back in 2019, I think it was pre COVID. And we were sitting there talking about it and we went through this paper and that's where we came up with the idea of doing this paper and it took forever with COVID, but <laughs> We finally got through it. Mike Steele and Guelph was, you know, a great resource on this. But it really changed the way he and I both view how these probiotics and prebiotics and eubiotics actually work in the animal. At a sale, a global leader in nutritional solutions and the provider of Smart Amine M. Visit MilkPay.com to calculate your return on investment when you balance your feed with amino acids. And to learn how Smart Amine M is the product for dairy producers who want to optimize milk production, component levels, and the lifetime performance of their herds. So it sounds like it's much more symbiotic than 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 what I always thought. Anyway, the, the gut Me bugs too. have There's a big, big, big effect on us or cows. Yeah. And the more we learn, the more I think that symbiotic category is probably the biggest impactor because there's interactions that we just don't understand going on. I guess in the, the last question here is, you know, and this is more probiotics. I know more about these. These are living organisms. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you have to feed these constant or do they establish in the, in the animal and then you can quit feeding them and still see responses? Usually, most of the organisms that are used as probiotics have to be fed daily because they aren't the normal gut bugs. And, you know, that microbial population in the, in the gut of the cow is so dense and thick and so based on competition that they're trying to murder each other constantly. They're trying to steal from one another. It's like the worst neighborhood you can imagine. So adding this, you know, this bug you've grown in a laboratory into basically the worst neighborhood you can imagine, they're, they're not going to have an easy time taking off and occupying that niche. But if you're constantly dosing them, they have that opportunity to have an effect without necessarily having to colonize. So we think of a more, or I tend to, as more of transient or transient and a low level of colonization. Okay. But we want to have that higher population, so we're boosting that population. Okay, great. This is this has been really interesting. In a in a future uh, recording, we're going to talk more about specific responses. But but thank you for this introduction. Thank you very much.